Well, a little bit over for the oil change, 220,043 miles on the 2013 Crosstrek. Today, we're gonna go ahead and do the oil change and filter change. So let's get into it. All right, guys, so we've got our Subaru Synthetic 530 oil. We've got our Japanese black oil filter, coke and ratchet, and a 14 and 17 millimeter socket and a large and small crush washer because I can never remember which year model they went from the 17 millimeter drain plug to the 14 millimeter drain plug. And I haven't peeked my head up under here yet. So we're gonna go ahead and do the oil and filter change and check the car over. Again, 220,000 miles on it. Uh, I think I was under 200 when I purchased this car. I think it was 190 something, or maybe it was just over 200. I can't recall. I'll put it on the screen below after going back and reviewing the video where I bought this car. But uh, yeah, I haven't really had any issues whatsoever to speak of. Uh, knock on wood, I don't wanna curse myself. But 220,000 miles on a 13 model, pulled the entire service record on it from Subaru. The only thing it ever had done to it under warranty was two front CV axles for clicking. Uh, I believe I replaced one front CV axle after purchasing it, uh, or maybe two. I can't remember if I replaced both or just the one. Uh, I went through and did the general maintenance, got everything up to date as we did videos on a uh, serpentine belt, cabin air filter, engine air filter, spark plugs, PCV valve, PCV uh, hoses, you know, just the common fluid filters, all that kind of stuff. We did a CVT fluid drain and refill. And the only other failure this car had documented from the dealership was a valve body failure, and that was replaced at 171,000 miles. This car has the original engine and the original CVT in it. Uh, not the valve body in the CVT, and this one has had its valve spring recall, but other than that, this has a, been a really, really good little car. And I really enjoy driving. I know a lot of people uh, talk down on the two liter in the cross trek with the CVT because it has only, I think, 135 or 145 horsepower. Going off memory here, I'll put that on the screen as well when I look it up. But honestly, I have no complaints in driving it. Um, I don't drive recklessly or like a speed demon. Uh, rarely do I pass anyone unless they're going extremely slow. So I really haven't been at a loss or a lack of horsepower. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great little car. The only complaint I have right now is fuel economy. And I think everyone's in this boat right now with the current state of the world. Uh, this car, when I first got it, I always document every single fuel tank I reset my trip meter and I always calculate my own MPGs. I don't rely on the little display there because they're always uh, just a guesstimate at best. They never give you an accurate number. So when I initially got the car, I was getting around 31.5, 31.8 miles to the gallon and mostly highway driving out here in the country, which was phenomenal for a two liter all wheel drive vehicle with uh, you know a higher ride height than say the regular Impreza version of this car. Now that was on the original 020 oil. I switched to 530. Uh, I didn't really notice any oil consumption, but I had 530 on hand. I stock 530 normally, as I don't really run the 020 weight oil from people, other people having issues with consumption and switching from 020 to 530 ends that consumption. We've talked about that previous videos. We've talked about the fact that, uh, you know, putting 530 in a engine that calls for 020 is not gonna harm the engine cause Japan runs much thicker stuff. They only run 020 in the US market for the EPA fuel economy. So when I switched over to the 530, I was still getting uh, 29 to 30 miles per gallon. And I got that for quite a while, but the last six to eight months with everything going on in the world today and the price of gasoline and the new emergency added ethanol and the fact that uh, we've had E10 ethanol gas for years and it's never been E10, every independent test I've seen puts it around 20% ethanol as they're lying to us at the pump. But I have seen my miles per gallon drastically drop with the exact same driving. Uh, as I said, a couple months ago, it dropped down to 
27 or so MPGs. And just my last two tanks were around 24, 25 MPGs, which is horrible. That's normally what I was getting in my 93 octane required three liter LL bean Outback, which uh, has me concerned. So I don't know if it's an issue with the vehicle. I mean, there's no check engine light, no faults. It runs great. Uh, but I'm concerned that the gas is the issue here. But another thing that's popped in my head is the fact that this thing now has 220,000 miles on it, and it has the factory oxygen sensor, air fuel ratio sensor. I'm not sure exactly which uh, nomenclature that Subaru uses for the particular sensors in these vehicles. I know that Subaru has gone to a wider band oxygen sensor, and they now use a bias voltage on it instead of how oxygen sensors used to work, where they produced uh, between zero and one volt. Uh, uh, now, I think they give them a two volt via bias voltage on them, and I think they are between two and three volts. Um, so, I'm curious if I should just go ahead and replace the auction sensors on this vehicle. I'm thinking I'm probably going to just to see if it improves my MPGs at all. Likely not. Uh, normally, auction sensors don't need to be replaced under normal conditions. Normally, the reason you replace them is because a heating element fails, the heating circuit inside, the heating element inside fails, or because the sensor gets contaminated, as we talked about in the oxygen sensor video, which I'll link up here in the top corner. But, you know, with 220,000 miles on factory sensors, after a while, they start getting slow, they start getting not as responsive, they start to get uh, build up on them and they don't function quite as accurately or swiftly. Now, normally you will get an oxygen sensor code for oxygen sensor uh, performance or out of range or, you know, stuck rich or stuck lean. None of that has occurred, but, you know, as preventive maintenance, it wouldn't hurt for the most part to put a set of oxygen sensors in a car that's running mechanically well. You know, as long as you don't have a head gasket leak and you're consuming coolant or, you know, you have a massive oil consumption issue and you're throwing oil down the tailpipe and contaminating that sensor, 100,000 miles, 150,000 miles, it's probably reasonable to expect the life of an oxygen sensor. So, not going to do it this video as I don't have one here, but the thought crossed my mind just the other day after I calculated my MPGs and saw they severely dropped. Um, I'm almost tempted to go back to 0 020 because it's now summertime here in the south and the thinner oil is not really going to, you know, be a concern. Although, you know, 0 020 would be more uh, beneficial in the wintertime than the summertime. Honestly, uh, you know, it's early spring here. We're seeing 80s. We're not going to see 90s to 100s probably until uh, June or July here, uh, which we're, I would want to switch back to a little bit thicker oil. But, uh, you know, we're going to do what we're going to do. Uh, upcoming videos on this thing, I need to check the cam cover gaskets. Uh, I noted when I first bought it, I thought they were leaking. I got a set of gaskets. We were going to do a video on that, but I cleaned them off and rechecked them the next oil change and they were still dry. I assume that when it was, uh, you know, it went into the dealership to get the valve spring recall done, that they simply did not clean anything off. They pulled the engine apart, threw the valve springs in there and dropped it back in as quickly as possible. We do have still a seeping rear main seal. I uh, do have that. I'm not ready to pull this engine quite yet as it's just seepage, just not, you know, dripping or pouring profusely. Uh, so it's not a big concern. And I believe we've got both thermostats. I think we've got the thermostat, the engine thermostat, and there's another thermostat way back here for the CVT. I don't think I can show you here on video. Maybe I can. So in the coolant crossover pipe, if this will focus, the back of the uh, coolant crossover pipe, right here where I'm pointing, that little bulge, there's another thermostat right there. These actually have two thermostats. And this one feeds coolant over to the CVT fluid warmer cooler is what it's called by Subaru. It both warms the fluid up when it's cold outside to get it to operate general temperature, and it also keeps it from overheating. Uh, so I don't know how old this coolant is. I assume they put new coolant in it when they pulled the engine and did the valve spring recall, but some dealerships are cheap and don't want to put any more money and fluids and other things in recall repairs and they have to so at some point uh probably before the winter time i'm gonna do the thermostats and replace the engine coolant on this vehicle i might wait 
or depending on how things go, do it in conjunction with pulling the engine for the rear main seal and probably reseal the upper and lower oil pan. Well, with all that said, uh, let's get to changing this oil. So per the usual, go ahead and remove your oil cap so you don't have uh, you know, suction on the engine uh, when you're trying to drain the oil. Take the oil cap off so air can flow in and the oil can flow out easily. So there's our answer there. The 2013 Crosstrek still used the 17 millimeter drain plug, so we'll be using the larger crush washer. And the great thing is with this one, you don't have to take the whole splash shield down to do the oil change. Let's see if I can do this without getting myself covered and scalding myself. Not quick enough that time. <laughs> that splash shield kind of gets in the way of getting out of there. Man, I'm not going to be TikTok famous today with... Uh, getting the oil plug out without uh, getting it all over my hands. So now I remember what was so goofy about the Crosstrek oil drain plug. So it still used the 17 millimeter head on it, but it uses the smaller of the two crush washers, the 8039160010. Whereas the older Subarus that had a 17 millimeter uh, head on their drain plug used this much thicker uh, crush washer and had a much larger diameter uh, threaded part to the drain plug. So while the oil is still draining, let's go ahead and remove our old oil filter. And yes, guys, if you can't remove your oil filter by hand, you're putting them on too tight. They don't need to be that tight. You really shouldn't have to use an oil filter socket and a ratchet or breaker bar, any of that stuff, guys. You know, spin it till it touches and like quarter to half a turn. That's all you really need. You don't have to be uh, putting it on there like uh, some 200 pound gorilla. A little bit of oil on the O-ring. touch and you're good man that aggravates me this one had Subaru facing forward this one doesn't tight it sucks having OCD and click so guys not sure how well you'll be able to see this but you can see that the bottom of the cam carriers are still dry and the cam covers are dry we swivel over here and you can see perhaps uh, this isn't coming too well uh, but there is quite a bit of seepage of oil there it looks like the oil pan needs reseal and uh, we can see it up the pan as well and around the back of the pan. Uh, but other than that, everything's still pretty much dry under this engine at 220,000 miles. So now time to install my fancy dancy little Subaru oil fill funnel available in my Amazon store, links in the description. And uh, put 5.1 quarts of oil in it. For whatever reason, I always like to put a little bit of Lucas Heavy Duty Oil Stabilizer in all my Subarus. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me for facts to back it up. Uh, I normally work on facts and logic and reasonable information. 
This is probably snake oil and probably always has been, but for whatever reason, I put a couple ounces in every one of my Subarus every time I change oil. I don't know why. I don't even think it's enough to really do anything, but I do. I really, really love this funnel. Just crack open a bottle, toss it in there. It holds it till it drains out and, uh, you know, ready to throw another one in till you're filled up. Let's see if I can do this one handed without making a giant mess. Chug it down. So 5.1 quarts of oil in the engine. Now time to put our spare quart of oil in the back, which got to always have a spare quart of oil in a Subaru. No matter what, I mean, it's always good just to have that extra oil on hand in case you need it. Uh, even if your vehicle doesn't have a problem, it doesn't take up much space. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. All right, fancy smancy Subaru oil funnel out. Oil cap back on. And I went ahead off camera real quickly and did an inspection front to back. Everything seems to be in a great condition right now on the cross track. Guys, it doesn't take that much time. One weekend, you know, you want to do your oil change in your vehicle, take an hour, two hours, look at over front to back. It's always better to find issues before they become a big problem. What's the old saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Every oil change, check the car over. Look at your suspension components. Look at your braking components, your steering components. You already have the car up in the air to drain the oil. Just take a peek. See if anything looks wrong. See if anything is leaking. See if anything in the engine compartment looks like it's, you know, having an issue like a frayed serpentine belt or maybe a swollen coolant hose. I mean, it doesn't take that much time, guys, to eyeball this stuff and, uh, you know, head off a potential problem or a dangerous situation you could be in with your vehicle. Check your brake pads. You know, check the thickness of it. Check the condition and level of all your fluids. It's real easy in a Subaru. Everything's marked with a bright yellow cap. Brake fluid, washer fluid, engine oil, engine coolant, engine oil level. It's all right there laid out for you. Uh, so again, you know, it doesn't take much time to do it. As I was always taught, check your oil every single time you put gas in your car to make sure you don't run low on oil. Don't trust the idiot light on the dashboard. And when you do an oil change, just do a once over on your car, make sure everything's good to go. All right, oil is filled up as always. Foot on the gas pedal all the way to the floor clear flood crank to prime our oil filter and our engine. Foot completely off the gas pedal, key off, start as normal. A lot of times if you don't do that, especially on higher mileage chain driven engines, you'll hear uh, rattle from your timing chains, you'll hear engine noise as that oil pressure takes a minute once the engine starts to uh, get up. You know, you gotta, you gotta have the oil pump spinning, it's gotta pull all that oil out of the pan, push it to the filter, prime the filter, and then start pushing it through the engine. So it's always a good idea, in my opinion, to prime it with a clear flood mode crank. And, you know, if you haven't driven the car in a week or so, I like to do a clear foot, clear flood mode crank as well before starting it, because after a week or so, that oil starts to drain back out of the oil filter and it loses its prime. So start the engine up, let it run a couple of minutes, get underneath, check, make sure your oil drain plug isn't leaking and back it off of your ramps or jack it up and remove the jack stands from it. Then let it sit on a level surface for five minutes or so. We'll let that oil have time to drain back into the oil pan and do your final oil level check and adjust as needed. And that's it, guys. Uh, so our 200,000 mile cross trek is a testament to how well a Subaru can run and how well it can last for hundreds of thousands of miles when properly cared for and maintained. Now, I didn't buy it new. I did not care for and maintain it its entire life. But given the service records and the fact that it was owned by someone that had it regularly serviced at the Subaru dealership, 
I can tell it was well taken care of. And also the fact there are no aftermarket parts on this car when I bought it or now, it's all genuine Subaru parts and fluids in the vehicle. So with that, that's the end of our checkup on the Crosstrek at its new milestone of 220,000 miles. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you all in the next one.